Okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> Thanks everybody for your patience. Um, we should have our chat is uh, happening there. Lots of people joining us from Wyoming and uh, Nelson, BC, Iowa. Lovely to see everybody. Thank you for your patience while we got that going. Um, I just want to introduce um, myself. My name is Sarah Reeves and I'm the marketing manager for New Society Publishers and we're really excited to welcome uh, Dan Chiras with us to talk to us about the Chinese Greenhouse. We would like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting from the unceded traditional territory of the Snunemo First Nations and that we're welcoming attendees from a wide range of territories. This past year has been a challenge on a variety of levels, but it has also brought lessons of community building, resilience, self-sufficiency, food security, and equity and diversity to the forefront. New Society Publishers remains committed to bringing you books that offer positive solutions for troubled times. Over the next couple of months, we're offering virtual events focusing on food and gardening. Our next event is April 22nd with Bevan Cohen, and he's talking on the topic of his new book, The Artisan Herbalist, Making Teas, Tinctures and Oils at Home. And we'll put the link uh, to register for that event in the chat. If you'd like to stay up to date with upcoming events, um, our sales and new books that are coming up, up off press, coming off press, you can sign up for our newsletter as well, and we'll put that link in the chat for you. And we'd like to, this virtual experience to be as interactive as possible. So please let us know as you have done where you're joining from and uh, posting qu questions in the chat as well. At the end of the talk, Dan will answer some of the questions posted and we'll give away a copy of his book, The Chinese Greenhouse, by choosing one of the posted questions in the chat comment sections. So be sure to participate for your chance to win. And as well, one of our Zoom attendees will be randomly sub um, selected to win a subscription to Harrow Smith, Canada's premier magazine on everything rural, organic, and green. And finally, we invite you to enjoy a 25% discount on all of Dan's books with us using the code CHIRAS25, and we'll put that in the chat as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dan. Uh, Dan is the author of 38 books, uh, including with New Society Publishers, Solar Electricity Basics, Power from the Wind, Power from the Sun, The Homeowner's Guide to Renewable Energy, and of course, The Chinese Greenhouse. And all of those titles, um, uh, you can use the 25% off code for on our website. Over the past 45 years, Dan has published articles on natural building, green building, solar electricity, passive solar design, self-sufficiency, and sustainability in publications such as Solar Today, Home Power, and Mother Earth News. I call him our renewable energy guru at for New Society Publishers. And he has installed numerous solar electric and wind systems in Missouri and is an avid gardener and has lived on solar electricity since 1996 and he lives on a solar and wind powered farm in Gerald, Missouri. Um, and so I'd like to welcome Dan to join us. Hey everybody, how you doing? Good to be here. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> you bet. Now, so my next job is to put the slideshow on. Good, good to see everybody. I'm gonna be, I'm in my Chinese greenhouse right now. It's a little bit warm, but wearing shorts and sandals to stay, stay uh, comfortable. But I'm in the Chinese greenhouse right now, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about Chinese greenhouses. Now these aren't Chinese greenhouses you have to buy from China, you can build your own, but it's a style uh, and a technique that was perfected by the Chinese starting in the eighties. And they have a big problem feeding a massive population. And so the Chinese greenhouse was part of the answer to that that challenge of, of feeding all these people and especially over the winter. How do you provide food to this uh, fairly massive population through the winter months? And how do you supply especially warm weather vegetables? Is there a way to grow tomatoes or, or, uh, or uh, cucumbers, that kind of thing throughout the winter only using solar energy. So that's what this is all about. And I'll get on, get the slideshow shared with you so we can start. And uh, hopefully everything will go well, there we go. All right, so 
Um, there's my contact information if you have questions or you need someone to help you with your design or construction, let me know. I'd be happy to help out. I'm officially retired, but <laughs> I don't know what that really means. Um, okay, Sarah, now my slides are not moving here. Okay, there you go. So also I have, besides the books that I've written, I've also got some YouTube presentations. These are three of them, Achieving Total Self-Sufficiency. Uh, another one called a series called Stop Mowing, Start Growing. I uh, stop mowing, I should say start growing. And um, the third one is what Mother Nature knows about sustainability that we don't. And it's a, it's a good guide for us to think about how to structure our lives, how to, um, you know, create a self-sufficient, sustainable way of living. So it's kind of fun fun presentation. I've also, in recent years, since I officially retired a few years ago, although I'm, I'm still writing books and <laughs> I don't know why I say I'm retired, I've also been doing a lot more music and I've been, I've been involved in music for many, 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 many years. And I have a website, windrivermusic.net, with some of my, uh, <clears throat> some of my original um, compositions. I also have quite a few on SoundCloud. So um, everybody knows you can get a copy of the book. Uh, New Society did an absolutely gorgeous job of this. I mean, I'm so proud of those guys. It's so beautiful. And um, I, many of you may know that I wrote this book. I, I self-published about three years ago, and I've been selling it at Mother Earth News Fairs. And in that period of time, I've been also revising it and learning and, you know, completing my greenhouse and learning basically how you operate one of these things and trying to find out what I did right, what I did wrong. So this new book is entirely rewritten. It's, it's my previous book, which is actually out in three editions. It's uh, completely revised and rewritten and beautiful colored photographs. So Without further ado, um, here's where we're going today. We're going to talk, what is a Chinese greenhouse? You have probably a little bit of an idea about it. I want to talk about, I don't have, you know, a whole lot of time. So I just want to talk about some of the major things you need to think about. Um, insulation and thermal mass, uh, something you don't really see in greenhouses. So I want to talk about that. And then properly orienting this greenhouse. We orient these entirely different than a standard greenhouse. And a big challenge we found and other people find uh, is cooling the greenhouse in the sun. So how can you keep that greenhouse cool and comfortable so it doesn't get too hot and fry your plants? I wanna talk a little bit about the proper glazing angle. That is, you know, what's the angle of the glass on the south side of that greenhouse? And I'm also, been, this whole book really is about taking the Chinese greenhouse and making it work even better, finding ways to make it work better, stay cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter than it, than it does <clears throat> based on its, on its uh, current design. So there's a, a chapter, or there are chapters, or I'm going to talk about uh, climate batteries for cooling, how you can use a, this thing called a climate battery to keep it cooler, and also how you can use that same climate battery to heat it and provide additional heat only so, using only solar energy. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the design specifications for heat banks. There's a lot more in the book, but I just want to give you a sense of what, what, you, what you have to do to design one. So this is a Chinese greenhouse in China. Um, it is a very odd creature as uh, greenhouses go. It's the ultimate in season extension. We're able to grow year round in ours. Um, we just finished harvesting tomatoes. Here it is March. We just finished harvesting our tomatoes. We, we've had tomatoes all year. We typically have peppers through February and March if the bugs don't get them. And now we, we've got growing in our greenhouse, we've got orange banana or orange tree, banana tree and uh, grapefruit and all kinds of things growing in here. Now I'll talk some more about that later. This is what it looks like. This is, wasn't quite done. You see the solar modules leaning up against the front. They're now mounted rack. I thought it looked a little more professional, but you can see it's earth sheltered. And you'll notice a very odd creature. It's earth sheltered all the way around, except on the south side. And the only glazing, the only uh, transparent or translucent surface that allows glass through is that south facing wall and that south facing roof. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing that's very, very different about this. Here it is in the dead of winter. This wasn't quite finished yet. What we found over the first three years is the temperature in the greenhouse um, 
never drop below 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And uh, this winter, which was particularly cold, we did get one night where it dropped to 40 degrees, in there, but it didn't kill anything. Everything still managed to do fine, but it stays very warm. Um, here's the interior where you can see we're growing some uh, different things, beans in the foreground and tomatoes and uh, char down there in the front and whatnot. So um, it's, just a, it's just a garden in there. Now we, we start, we grow squash in here. Um, we've, we've had a little bit of trouble with that because of the moisture. We also, this, we also have an aquaponic system in here. So there's a lot more moisture. So we've had some old problems in, in powdery mildew, so, but we're still working on that. And we grow some kratom and um, now when you look online, I want you to be really careful when you read about Chinese greenhouses because a lot of people have built them, but um, built them above ground. And in my view, a, a above ground Chinese greenhouse is nowhere near as effective as a earth sheltered one. It, it'll get hotter in the summer and colder in the winter unless you compensate. And I talk about that in the book. So if you, if you don't have a slightly sloped site and you have to build above ground, there are some ways to compensate that. But if you have a, a sloped property, even with a very, very slight five or 10 degree slope, it's a good idea to earth shelter these greenhouses. Um, they'll stay warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. So what exactly is a Chinese greenhouse? Well, Chinese greenhouse is designed to grow warm weather vegetables throughout the off season, you know, the late fall, winter, and early spring, when usually we retire our gardens. And this is a photograph from my actual Chinese greenhouse in China, year 2004, and this is March 7th. And you can see they've got some kind of squash growing in there in March inside the greenhouse. It's kind of a new generation of greenhouse. It's a departure from the conventional greenhouse. Um, and it's designed for off-grid performance. So you don't have to heat it or cool it. No extra heating and cooling required. Supplied entirely by renewable energy resources. Now, if you're in a real cloudy area, um, you may want to supplement some lighting. We, we use some LED grow lights from a company called Happy Leaf to uh, supplement the lighting because Missouri gets pretty cloudy in the winter. So some, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll have a bank of lights that turn on over certain grow beds for a couple hours after the sun sets every day, just to give them a little extra sunlight. So what are the secrets to the successful all season greenhouse? Basically, you design it a lot like a passive solar home. And uh, as many of you know, uh, one of my very first books in green building was called uh, The Solar Home. And uh, it's a, a book on passive solar heating and cooling, which is a subject that's very near and dear to my house, to my heart. I've lived in several, I've designed and built a couple of them and I consult on the construction of these. They're basically homes that heat and cool themselves naturally without the addition of either wood heat or natural gas or electricity. Um, so they're really neat structures for those of you who want to live green, you know, to minimize your impact and your carbon footprint. So here's my home in Colorado. I don't live there anymore, but I still own the house. It's earth sheltered. You can see grass growing up on the roof. Um, occasionally when I lived there, I lived there for 14 years. Occasionally when, um, when I, I would wake up in the morning, I'd hear elk walking around on the roof eating the grass, but it's earth sheltered, the glazing, the glass, the solar aperture, if you want to call it, is on the south side. So that allows that low angle winter sun to come in and uh, super insulated and airtight. So this is the book I was talking about, if any of you were interested. Um, basically, the solar greenhouse, uh, a Chinese greenhouse is designed <clears throat> for year-round comfort, as I've said before, warm in the winter, cool in the summer, and it does so naturally. You don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on fuel bills or uh, burn cords of wood to keep this greenhouse from freezing in the winter. And is, they're really designed, everything about them is designed 
to primarily capture that sun, that low angled sun. You know how low the sun gets in the sky starting in the fall, the winter and early spring. So it's designed to capture that low angled sun in the off season. And um, just like a passive solar home, it provides the heat when you need it the most in the coldest part of the year. They're typically oriented on an east-west axis. That is the long axis of the greenhouse runs east and west. And if you look around, you'll see that most greenhouses these days run north and south. Um, not optimal for winter growing. So the other thing that we do in both a solar home and a solar greenhouse is we minimize or eliminate the glazing on the other sides of the structure, on the north sides and east and west sides. And the reason for that is twofold. We want to increase, reduce in the winter heat loss. We don't want a lot of, of glass or plastic, which has almost no insulated value. We don't want a lot of that um, in the winter because we're just going to lose any of the solar heat we gain or we're going to lose a lot of the solar heat that we gain. So we're going to minimize the glazing on the northeast and west sides, insulate the daylights out of the structure. Now it's something we don't do with greenhouses, but we're going to insulate it. Any structure that's not glass, we want insulated and we also want to insulate any, uh, I, ca I call it glass, but we usually use plastic. Any, any, um, place that has glass or plastic, we still want to insulate that as well. And another key component of a, a passive solar home is thermal mass. That's just some solid material. I don't know if you can see now, you can't see in the background, but we built ours out of rammed earth tires filled with uh, mud or uh, uh, subsoil and some river gravel. And that's and then we plastered over those so we have thick walls that will absorb that heat during the day and then release it at night. Same thing in a passive solar home. And another common, another very important feature is airtight design. You want these things airtight, not your typical greenhouse. We're building a structure that we want to stay warm in the winter. Here's a, a drawing that my son did for the book. Bless his heart, he illustrated this book. He's illustrated about six of my books now. But this gives a cutaway showing um, you know, kind of a typical modern Chinese greenhouse. You can see it's sort of sheltered. You see a thermal wet mass wall. They're in kind of a pinkish clay color. Um, you see the insulated north facing roof and the design of the greenhouse as is allows it to be heated by that low angle winter sun. You'll also notice there's a thermal blanket. Now the Chinese use external thermal blankets to, to insulate it if you have any amount of snow in your area, you really don't want that on the outside. And I'll talk some more about that later. So everybody got that? That's what we're looking at. Notice that thermal mass wall is fairly well insulated from the ground beneath it. You don't have to fully berm it. You can see I've showed several different options, full berm, partial berms, but uh, it's really important to berm that structure and that just helps it stay warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. So these two structures, although they look different, rely on the exact same principles. Okay, those are the principles we've been talking about. Very, very different from this creature, this, uh, uh, this hoop house. Very, very different animal, entirely different animal. Um, so the Chinese greenhouse is designed to grow warm weather vegetables, as we've said, I'm repeating myself, I realize it, um, using only solar energy, earth sheltered, long axis oriented east and west, insulated and especially at night during the winter. We want to keep whatever heat we get in that winter. We want it to stay there. Built with thermal mass to retain heat, built airtight, and then you'll have you'll very likely have to find some way to cool it in the summer. We're trying to do as much passive cooling and solar cooling as possible in our greenhouse and um, I'll tell you more about that. So one of the key successes is this um, nighttime insulation. And this is what you're looking at here is a early generation, real early, like 1980s uh, Chinese greenhouse. You can see it's plastic. The, um, and what the Chinese did is they built <laughs> marvelous uh, straw blankets. <laughs> can you imagine how hard that is to build this straw blanket? Then they do roll down over the greenhouse at night and roll back during the day. Um, amazing and um, 
kind of impractical, so I'm not going to recommend that. They uh, got the idea that that wasn't such a good idea and went to a synthetic material, still walked it up and down, um, or walked it down and rolled it back up at, day, at, at uh, daybreak, so not the most practical thing in the world. Then they um, started using mechanics, these uh, uh, basically electric motors that would raise and lower that blanket. Now, again, do not put a, I highly recommend that you stay away from external blankets if you have any amount of snow, because you don't want to wake up in the morning and find a foot of snow on the blanket and be unable to remove it. So we do all our blanketing inside the greenhouse itself. So um, here, here's a, a photograph of, or two slides showing what we use. We, in our greenhouse, we use this double walled polycarbonate plastic. It's got an air space, which is an insulator. And then, um, it, so that basically helps hold the heat in. If you're in a particularly cold area, you might wanna go to a, a four wall, let's see, one, two, three, four wall, um, a three wall design that has two air spaces. It's a little more costly, but it'll provide better insulation, hold that heat in at night. The other uh, insulation that we have this uh, a sun cloth, sunshade, we suspended it, I'll show you again, we suspended it using braided cable. That's a, a braided steel cable with a plastic coating on it, and it's connected in the top and the bottom of the greenhouse. Uh, in this case, this is called a turnbuckle. It allows us to tighten it, so it's, it's, it's attached by an eye screw with a turnbuckle that allows you to tighten it so, it, so the uh, uh, shade cloth moves up and down. Now, originally we started with just a traditional polyester uh, shade cloth, but we've then transitioned to a new material that we find very, uh, very effective. It's a, the one product is called Tempa, Tempa Interior Climate Screen. And there's a picture of it in a Chinese greenhouse up in Wisconsin. Here's what it looks, up, looks like up close. It is uh, polyethylene, uh, UV treated, and it's silverized, metalized. It's, a, it's got a metallic surface on it. And what it does is it, a, it reduces the sun uh, in the summer. It reduces the amount of sunlight that penetrates your greenhouse. And in the winter, um, so you keep, it, uh, during, uh, you keep it on during the day. We, we pull ours when in, in Missouri, it gets so blessed hot. We, Ours shades about 30%, removes about 30% of the incoming solar radiation, but it helps keep that greenhouse uh, at a reasonable temperature under 90 degrees. And it's really important that you do that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but if, if um, when photosynthesis starts to slow down in plants when they reach about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't know what that is in centigrade, but, um, and, and then it, um, and, and it completely stops by 100 degrees. So you do not want that greenhouse to get really hot. You want to basically keep it cooler in the summer. So we use this product, it's called Illuminat. We've had better luck. Uh, well, we, this is more widely available, it seems, than the previous product, that TCIS. And it comes in, there, certain companies will, will uh, give it, will sell it pre-cut with uh, a cloth border around it with uh, grommets in it. So I, I, I would look for Illuminat that seemed very helpful. We also, this is our greenhouse early in the construction phase. You can see we built on rammed earth tires. Each of those tires was packed full of dirt, solid, uh, you know, basically solid dirt. They're all used tires. We used about 200 of them in our greenhouse. And then the back wall is framed with two by 12s and that wall is completely insulated. We will fill that with insulation. And you can see the north facing roof, roof is also, it's 12 inch TJIs. Those are basically a uh, manufactured truss material um, or not truss, but a rafter. Um, and so that's also a 12 inch cavity that we will fill with insulation. Once, what we did is once we, once we had the wall, we started plastering. You can see down below, we've got an earthen plaster going on there. We, we put two layers of, of 11 or, uh, I can't remember, 12 mil plastic over the opening. And then we blew cellulose insulation in there, just packed it full of insulation and packed it down real tightly. So we got, uh, when you pack cellulose, you get an R value of about 0.5. 
3.2 per inch. Now, when you want to be sure that insulation stays dry, especially in a greenhouse, because even a tiny bit of moisture will lower the R value, its insulation value by half. So you want to be sure that insulation doesn't get wet. That's why we use two layers of uh, polyethylene and fairly thick polyethylene. And then we then we, then we put uh, OSB, painted OSB, we painted some oriented strand board white, and then we applied this uh, aluminized reflective material on top of that. So we did, so we covered it and we taped all the seams so that moisture couldn't get in there. This is, here it is early in the construction process. We haven't quite trimmed it, but you get an idea now. There's plywood on the framing and then this, and we actually taped the seams of that plywood just to keep the water moisture out. And then we applied this, uh, this material. It used to be called Reflectix. That was a, that's a company product name like, like Xerox. But, and then I taped those seams with metal aluminum tape just to keep the moisture out. Now, the other, so that's important. It's really, really important. Don't skimp on insulation. You want to keep that structure warm on cold winter nights. Um, the other key, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, is thermal mass. You need something on a, a cold, sunny day. You need some material, some solid material, like earthen material or concrete or cement blocks filled with sand or concrete. You need some kind of solid material in there that will absorb the surplus heat during the day. That keeps the greenhouse from getting too hot. And then that thermal mass is kind of like a sponge. It releases, you squeeze it at night. It's, you don't squeeze it physically, but it, you, at night the heat is released back into the greenhouse. So that helps create thermal stability in your greenhouse. You can see in this one, this is actually from China. You can see what they've done is they've charged that back wall. They've put a coat of cement uh, stucco on that back wall and they've got a, a, a concrete walkway. All of that helps increase the thermal mass and helps keep that greenhouse warmer through those cold winter nights. Now, as I said, we use rammed earth tires. Um, if I, <laughs> if I were to do it again, I wouldn't, but um, I'm 70 now, so <laughs> so I'm I, uh, not as young. I built a render tire home in Colorado in the in the 90s when I was in my when I was in my 40s, and and it wasn't quite as hard as this. But we we basically these are filled with uh, filled with the dirt that we excavated from the site, the subsoil, and packed full, so they're each tire by the time you fill it is about 300 pounds of thermal mass. And then we came out back through and plastered it. And we put mud in the in grooves in the uh, interstices between the tires and, and eventually covered it with plaster. So we had a very nice thick wall of thermal mass to help hold that heat in. Now, if I were to do it again, <laughs> I would very seriously look at something like this. These are these are uh, cement blocks, concrete blocks, excuse me. They're called bin blocks. If you've ever been to a landscaping company that supplies landscaping, um, you'll find these blocks there. What, when, and where you can purchase them is from con as, uh, companies that provide concrete. What they do is when a truck re returns from a delivery, if there's any surplus, what they'll do is they'll pour it into these forms and make these concrete blocks. And they sell them for practically nothing. They're relatively inexpensive. And I think I've got some more slides. Um, they have a little hook in the top. See that one in the top? You can't quite see it. So you can get a hook in there and place them uh, on top of one another, kind of like uh, Legos. Um, they, they go together really, really well, really easily. And uh, you probably wouldn't even have to plaster over that wall. You have a nice thick thermal mass. We spent, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you this, um, off and on two and a half years doing the tires on this, this structure. So it was hard, hot work. You know, we wouldn't do, we weren't working every day, needless to say, we'd be doing six or 10 tires and then a month later come back and do 20 or 30. And, but it took us a good two and a half years. We could have done the same, built the same structure in a day or two with using these cement blocks. So our concrete blocks. So I just highly recommend it. As I mentioned though, they're cheap, they're inexpensive, but they're a, a booger to transport. They're very heavy. So if you've got a, a tractor and a trailer or something, you can pick them up yourself. 
all the better because that's where you that's where the money will be involved. You could also use uh, these cement blocks. Uh, you want to fill them with sand or concrete, or you could use these solid uh, cement blocks as well. So there are other options for thermal mass. Now, um, the, the cool thing about, let me see if I can move. Yeah, okay, so the cool thing about um, these greenhouses is that you really start to plant about the time most gardeners are closing down shop. We plant ours in, our, you know, for the winter crops, we plant in September, usually early September. We can plant as, little, as late as October, November. The earlier you get it in, the better. Get those plants growing before it gets cold. So you plant in the, in the off season when you're shutting your regular garden down. Oops, let's see, there we go. Um, and here, let's see, I don't know what the date on this one is, but here it is, newly planted. This is some kind of a squash or cucumber growing in there. Um, you'll notice this is the old style Chinese greenhouse with lots of posts holding up the roof supports. We no longer really include many supports like that. And then you can harvest your, your greenhouse, harvest in January, February, March, and April. Um, we'll have stuff for our farmer's market, which is which begins in another month. We'll have abundance of lettuce and Swiss chard and, and even some patio tomatoes available. So maybe not, I don't know if our cucumbers will be ready yet, but we'll have an abundance for that April farmer's market. No one else will have anything unless they've been growing in a greenhouse. So harvest it, like I said, in January, February, March, harvest all winter long. There's nothing cooler than going out in January when it's 20 below zero and picking tomatoes from your, your greenhouse. Um, in fact, I just ate one last night with, on a, on a uh, salad. So orientation, another key thing here, orientation. And I mentioned this earlier. Let me see, I'm having a few technical problems here. Um, we orient th so that the long axis runs east and west. And that's because, as most of us know, the sun cuts a fairly low path across the sky during the winter months. This drawing um, from the book actually shows the path of the sun at different times of the year. And you'll notice that the green line, see the green line in the middle and the blue line at the bottom, that, that path in the middle, that green path is where the sun will be located at different times of the day during the middle of the year, the, the spring and fall equinoxes. That's the, the midpoint between fall, between winter and summer. So that's when it starts getting cold in, you know, in, um, in the fall, in September. And then the, the, green, the blue line is the low point. It's the lowest the sun will get during the winter solstice. So we're going to design this greenhouse so it is oriented to accept that low angled winter sun. And the best way to do that is to orient it on an east-west axis. So that will give you the maximum um, solar gain. And now it's important that you um, orient to true south, not magnetic south. Okay, now what do I mean by that? What exactly is true south? Well, we don't need to get into a long discussion here, but if you remember from eighth grade geography, the earth is divided into lines of longitude and latitude. And the lines of longitude run from the North Pole to the South Pole, okay? The lines of latitude run from the um, equator all the way up to the North Pole again, and they run perpendicular to the lines of longitude. So true North and South is determined by the lines of longitude, and they don't line up with the magnetic lines. As many of you know, the Earth is a huge magnet. We have a North Pole and a South Pole, just like a real magnet. Well, we are a real magnet. And that's due to this inner core of nickel and, and iron that this hot molten interior core kind of rotates and creates this mass, massive magnetic field around the Earth. And that creates these magnetic lines but they don't correspond with true north and south. They are off a little bit. In fact, they're off quite a lot in some places. Now, I was gonna show you this slide just to show you that magnetic field makes life on earth possible. If it weren't for that, we'd be bombarded with this uh, solar wind, these high energy particles given off by the sun. So um, thank goodness for that magnetism. 
Now, the, the thing to remember here is that true south and magnetic south very rarely coincide. St. Louis, for example, there's a line through the middle of the country where they where they line up. And that's what this map shows you. So everybody go ahead and see where you are. If you're from Europe, I'm sorry. But, you know, sh see where you live and look at the line, look at the dark red lines. And that'll tell you what we call the magnetic declination. And all that means is that's how far true south is off from magnetic south. Okay, so notice the state of Missouri, there's a line, well, notice in the middle, there's a zero degrees. It's not quite in the middle, but zero runs straight down the United States. Anywhere along that line, it turns out that the lines of longitude actually line up with the magnetic, or, or excuse me, the north, mag, excuse me, um, true north and south, the lines of longitude line up exactly with the magnetic lines. But as you move west, say let's move ourselves west from Missouri. Everybody got me, you know where Missouri's that funny st state with that little boot heel at, down at the bottom there. Um, and then as you move to Kansas, let's go to the five degree line. You see that's about, mm, it's probably a little past the peak of Kansas, maybe Manhattan, I'm not exactly sure. But along that line, you notice it says five degrees. Then you go out to Denver, Colorado, and you'll notice that line says 10 degrees. Then you go out to California and Idaho and Nevada and it's 15 degrees. What that means is if you're standing, let's, let's, let's go to Colorado. Let's say you're standing along that red line. Now you won't see that on the earth obviously, but if you say you go to that red line and you're standing at that spot, your compass points to south. What you need to do though is adjust for true south. And what that line tells you at that point is that True south is 10 degrees east of your mag of the magnetic line, uh, south reading. So you stand anywhere along that line. True south will be 10 degrees east. You go out to that 15 degree line out in California, Nevada. Same thing. Anywhere along that line, true south is 15 degrees east of magnetic south. Now, if you go east of St. Louis. Go, let's go say to, let's start that. Florida is easy to identify. Let's go through to central Florida. You see there's a five degree line. Then we go into um, Western New York and Pennsylvania, 10 degrees. And then we go up to the up these New England states, 15 degrees. Now, if you're standing it along these lines, say let's, let's take the five degree line. Let's say you're in Tennessee. <clears throat> Um, if you're standing anywhere along that line, your compass reads true uh, magnetic south. In this case, true south is five degrees west, five degrees west of your magnetic reading. So be sure that you get this right. Don't go out with a compass if you're living out west or back east or somewhere in the middle. Don't go out there with your compass and measure your north and south and assume it's correct. Okay, there are other things to watch for is there are local variations in the magnetic field. So your compass reading will be influenced by iron or steel or nearby magnets, which needless to say, uh, if you drive up in your uh, electric car and step out the side door and, and uh, point your compass, you're gonna get an erroneous reading because you're too close to that steel and, and God knows what else is in there. Um, so be, go away from uh, vehicles, uh, steel posts, anything like that, because that will, that will locally deviate your, your compass reading. We call it magnetic deviation. So that'll screw it up. So step away from the vehicles, kids. And also barns, metal barns. Oh, Lord, they just... They just really completely screw up the magnetic field in that area. So be super careful if you're anywhere near a magnet, uh, metal barn. Um, they'll they'll knock the they'll knock the magnet that magnetic for, field force by easily 15, 20, 30 degrees. They just completely go crazy with it. Okay, so how steep should that south facing wall be? Here's the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is you take your latitude and add 20 degrees, and that will give you the ideal roof uh, slope on the south face of your greenhouse. So if you live, say we're at 38 degrees north latitude, you add 
20 degrees to that. That should, your, your angle, the, your front face of your greenhouse should be at about 60 degrees, 58 degrees. And what that'll do is that'll help minimize the amount of sunlight coming in to the greenhouse in the summer. So that'll give you optimum absorption of sunlight during the fall, late fall, winter and spring, but it'll minimize the amount of solar radiation in the summer, which will help keep that greenhouse cooler. So everybody's aware, take this, take them, if you're from the States or Mexico or Canada, take a look, you can see what your latitude is, you can get an idea. So just add 20 degrees to that, and that's your ideal, that's the ideal slope for the south facing roof. It's pretty steep, 60 degrees is a pretty, um, pretty steep slope. I gave this talk once in Belton, Texas at the Mother Earth News Fair, which they're supposedly going to have this fall and this October. They're 38, 30 degrees north latitude, so the proper uh, angle would be 50 degrees. Now, um, I'm going to skip this slide. I talk about it in the, in the book, and you'll um, basically what this just illustrates, let's take a look at the vertical axis. That's light transmission from zero to 100%. The bottom axis is the angle of incidence. That's the angle at which sunlight strikes the surface of the glass. And you'll notice that the, let's just look at the top two lines. These are, um, I can't see what they are. They're uh, polycarbonate materials, but you'll notice it's not until we get to around um, 60 degrees that we actually start seeing the amount of light transmission decreasing. So anything shorter than that is, Anything, uh, any angle less acute than that is going to not affect light transmission, according to this, this research. And it's from, published in the book also by my friends at New Society called The Year Round Solar Greenhouse. Excellent book, excellent book. So anyway, so everybody got that. That's about what we're shooting for. Now, <clears throat> we didn't make ours quite so steep. Ours is only about 30 degrees. If I were to do it again, I would definitely crank it up. So I would definitely increase. So if you ever come here for a tour or whatnot, um, I don't know what the whatnot is, but if you ever come for a tour, um, we'll, uh, we'll, you'll see that's one of the things I'll point out that if I were to do this again, I'd, I'd change that slope. I'd make it even steeper than it is. Um, <clears throat> And I should mention that we are, my wife and I have a little straw bale building on our property that we're getting ready. We're fixing it up to be, have an Airbnb and then, and we can uh, host people who want to come here and learn about all the things we do sustainably. So keep in contact with me through my, through my uh, uh, email address or my, uh, or text me. I'll give you that phone number later. Okay. Heat and cooling. Remember, these structures naturally heat and cool themselves. They, uh, they, they stay warm in the winter, cool in the summer. But I, that's not enough for me. I, I want to see if I can make this greenhouse perform even, even better. And so let's start with the winter temperature regulation. We're going to start talking about a thing called climate battery. Okay, It's not an electrical uh, structure. It's a... It's, it's a... Um, it's a technique, it's a device that allows us to store heat. This graphic shows you what happens in a greenhouse. During the day, even on a cold winter day, as long as it's sunny, you'll find the greenhouse can get really quite warm. Um, that hot air will rise to the top of the greenhouse. And what we've done is we've mounted some um, thermostatically controlled fans they're direct current electricity, so they run directly off some solar cells. We don't have any batteries. And what happens is when, when it gets to 80 degrees, those fans kick on and they pump that heat that's gathering up near the ceiling down through a series of pipes in our floor. And our floor is made out of just good old river gravel. And they pump it, in, and it's the, the pipes are maybe three or four inches deep, below, you know, below the surface. So it pumps that hot air into those pipes, and the heat that the heat then is stored in the floor during the day, and then it moves into the greenhouse at night. So this is an active underfloor heat storage system. We're actively storing that heat, the excess heat during the winter. And that, what that does is it really does two things. It provides us with additional nighttime heat. And it also helps keep the greenhouse from getting too hot on some days. Because we can get, it can get pretty hot in here 
in the you know in the late fall and early spring when it when the ambient temperatures are increasing. So um, we don't really have too much problem with overheating in the dead of winter, except on really, really sunny days. But if you live in Colorado or New Mexico or Arizona or some sunnier climate, overheating in the winter could become a problem. So consider very seriously putting this in. And I will show you how we did ours. I think I've got sides. Oh, another thing that we want to try, we haven't, we haven't done this yet, is I have some raised beds in the greenhouse. And one of the things that I want to do is hook those pipes up to the soil in that, in that raised bed so I can pump the heat directly into that raised bed. And I want to put a little hoop over the top to hold that heat in and create a microclimate. So that's something you might consider. I haven't quite got there yet. Insulate the box that it's in and, and then run that heat, that extra heat during the day through that, um, through the soil to warm up those plants. If you grow aquaponically, and we have two aquaponic systems in this greenhouse, you could also run those heat pipes underneath your grow beds. So as we've shown in this, in this particular drawing. So just some ideas on ways to heat. And, and aquaponics or aquaponic growers know, growers know that that's a huge challenge, especially if you're raising tr uh, tropical fish like tilapia. It's really difficult to keep that water warm enough for them. So this is something you might consider. It will certainly save you a lot of money on, on water heating. Um, the other thing to do, which we did, is we just, we have a big farm pond and we just caught bluegills and, and uh, some bass and we, so they can handle the colder weather, but uh, that's something else to think, think about. So, so the climate battery helps the greenhouse in the winter stay cooler and it heats it at night. It's just a temporary storage of excess heat. That's all you're doing. It's just a short-term heat storage for nighttime use. And that helps your plants stay, stay wonderful, uh, wonderfully comfortable. <clears throat> now, how this works is that the solar heat um, circulates through a series of perforated pipes in the ground. And that heat is then transferred to the cooler ground in the in your we call it a climate battery and the warm as you can imagine what you're pumping into the ground is warm moist air so your warm moist air when it cools the water condenses out of that air and this process is almost like a miracle of physics and nature that condensation of water that when it goes from a from a vapor state to a, to a liquid state, that gives off a bucket more heat, tons more heat. So you're not just pumping warm air through there, you're pumping water vapor, which is heated. And when it condenses, it gives off a bucket load of heat. And that heat then provides more heat for your floor. And, and for the physicists, chemists, and scientists among us, that's called the latent heat of condensation. For the rest of you, don't worry about it, but it's a really cool phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> so this will cool the greenhouse, so I keep repeating myself, this will cool the greenhouse during the day in the winter. And it's really important, it's really important to, to control that heat during the off season as well, because if it's too hot and you don't have enough light, you'll find your plants spindling, things like tomatoes and, and, uh, and uh, um, peppers will grow real long and, and spindly thin. So you want to be able to control the heat and, and light. Now, that process that I was telling you about, the process of actually of allowing that heat to, uh, that moist air to condense, allows us to acquire, spelled acquire wrong, <laughs> five times. Why do you never notice your typos till you're showing a slideshow and totally embarrass yourself? So anyway, this allows you to extract five times more energy from that air than you would if you were just capturing the heat. That's un almost unbelievable. So think seriously about a climate battery. This will allow you to greatly improve the performance of your Chinese greenhouse. And, and it, it's all explained in the, um, it's all explained in the books, in the book. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the physics of it right now, because I, um, I know we're running low on time here. We got started a little late, but I want to get through this slideshow. But I explain what, why that actually occurs. I, I promise you, I'm not making this up. It's not, it's not fake science. It's really, it really occurs. And it's, it's all due to the fact that it takes a lot of energy 
to make that water go from, you know, to evaporate that water, either from a fish tank or from your the soil in your planters or your raised beds. Okay. So, so at night, the, at night, some people actually actively pump the heat out of their, of their um, climate batteries. So you can actually run those pumps at night. I decided not to. Our floor is thin enough that I just want that heat to kind of radiate up, to migrate up by conduction, and then radiate into the greenhouse. And it seems to work really, really well. Now, it's important that you design this climate battery carefully. And, and there's some guidelines here. I don't imagine you'll all get, I mean, it's pretty complicated, and, but it's in the book if you want to, if you're interested. Um, basically, you need to circulate the volume of the air house, the, excuse me, the volume of air in the greenhouse. Say you've got, I'll just keep the math simple, a thousand square uh, cubic feet of air in your greenhouse. You want it, that to, to cycle through that climate battery at least five times every hour. Okay, so you're going to have to figure out how to make that happen, how much air you're going to have to blow through those pipes so that it circulates through there five times per hour. That will uh, provide you sufficient amount of air movement and heat exchange to heat up that floor. And the pump, or the fan, excuse me, the fan that you'll be using um, will pump at about five feet feet per second or one and a half meters per second. So keep that in mind. Um, and this is all designed to give you that optimal heat capture and heat transfer, capture from the greenhouse and, and transfer into the climate battery. All right, now <clears throat> we're also playing with some ideas of even heating this greenhouse more. Uh, and we're supplementing, we, there are ways you can supplement the heat storage with solar hot water systems and solar hot air systems. And we've designed and built our own solar hot air system that we haven't got quite installed yet, but we're, I'll show you what it looks like. The, the whole idea here is that in the dead of winter, if you have some supplementary solar heat, you can increase the temperature in your climate battery. So you'll notice in this slide, the hot air rises to the top and that air is pumped through the fan down into this heat exchanger in the floor. But what we're doing is we're going to install a solar hot air system mounted next to the greenhouse, which captures more heat, more heat energy from the sun. And we're gonna pump that down into the floor as well. So it, the greenhouse will theoretically and hopefully will actually um, stay warmer at night. We'd like to keep it up around 60 degrees. So uh, we, we, we do notice that things slow down when it gets to 50. Thing, some, some vegetables in particular like chard don't even like it that cold. Spinach and lettuce will grow, but chard tomatoes, they, they like it a little bit warmer. Here's one that we made during a workshop. This is a, we made, we uh, built a wooden box with some scrap lumber, lined it with an inch and a half um, polystyrene, and then we, then we applied, and then we installed some metal roofing inside there to, that's gonna be our heat absorber plate. That's gonna absorb the sunlight. You'll notice we put some spacers in there because we're gonna put a, a layer of plastic over this. And we put um, some flashing along the side to protect that, protect that uh, foam from UV damage. And then we covered it with this, uh, with this uh, corrugated plastic. And that's our homemade solar heater. You'll notice there's a hole in the bottom and a hole in the top. And what we're going to do is mount a little tiny um, uh, uh, inline DC vent fan, duct fan, and we'll put it in there. When the, and the sun shines on a, a solar electric module, we'll turn that fan on. And it, what it'll do is it'll draw cool air from the greenhouse through the bottom vent, through the bottom hole, circulate it through this very crude solar collector, heat it up, and we're expecting, I've had a lot of experience using these before, but we're expecting it will heat it up 20 or 30 degrees. So if we're taking 50 degree air from the greenhouse, we're, we're hoping it'll heat that air at least 20 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and blow that heated air into the greenhouse, just providing supplemental, additional supplemental heat. And we want to store that in the floor, okay? So this is what <coughs> a climate battery looks like. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, take a look at this. You can see this pictures in the book. You can see basically it's a good idea to insulate around your climate battery because as you heat the earth, that, uh, that warmth is going to migrate away from your pipes and it migrates at about a meter a month, about three feet per month. So if you insulate underneath your uh, heat pipe in your climate battery, that'll help contain that, that uh, heat within the climate battery, okay? So um, you'll notice that this design, actually I, I, I drew it two ways so that, my son actually drew it two ways. One, so that um, you could build it with a straight material like two by fours. We use pressure treated two by four rafters or you could use an arched roof trust or an arched roof um, arch metal, like a tubular metal or a square tubular metal or round tubular metal. Now notice the north facing wall is um, highly insulated, two by 10, two by 12 framing. And you notice the thermal mass wall as well. So that's a, that's a good, simple design. Now, one thing that we really wanted to do, but we weren't able to, is we wanted to build an even deeper uh, climate battery. Unfortunately, we live on the top of a hill in Missouri, and when, you, when we got down six feet, we hit solid limestone. So we were actually going to build a whole another set of pipes deep in the earth, and the purpose of that was going to be to try to take all that extra heat we have in the summer from the greenhouse and stick it deep underground and then call it up during, uh, call it, call for it, bring it into service in the winter months. This is a long-term heat storage um, strategy. And it sounds pretty wacky, but it really works. There's, there are a lot of, I, I present some examples in the book of some companies in Great Britain that are collecting heat underneath um, the driveways and parking lots of schools and universities pumping that heat deep into the earth, deep into the earth and then calling it, calling for it during the dead of winter. And it's working very, very effectively. And I explain all that in the book. Um, so just something to keep in mind. What we've done since we weren't able to go deep is we have, we have installed pipe in our earthen berm. We haven't hooked it up yet, but we've installed some pipe there, which we hope to hook up to the greenhouse and then basically pump that, all that heat we get in the, in the winter or in the summer, excuse me, pump a lot of that heat into the ground and hopefully it'll heat the berm around the greenhouse and help us keep it warmer. I don't think that'll be as effective as putting it deep underground directly under the greenhouse, but we didn't have much choice. So that's, there's tons of information, uh, more information to talk about, but that should give you a good idea. I, I do wanna point out that um, you don't, you can build a Chinese green hut on a relatively flat piece of property with just a little tiny bit of slope. And there's some diagrams in the book that show you how you can do that. We don't really have a terribly steep slope, maybe, maybe 10 degrees here in our backyard, but we were able to deep dig enough down deep, dig, dig deep enough down into the ground to, um, basically place the greenhouse into the ground and on the dirt that we excavated from the ground, we pushed around the back to berm it up. So my friends, I would like at this point to stop um, chit chatting and allow you to answer some or ask some questions. And Sarah, how do we do this? Okay, well, we have had, uh, Brittany's been collecting all of the questions from both Facebook and Zoom. And some people have indicated that they do need to leave and we will send you a recording um, of this. So if you are missing any of your, if you posted a question and you can't stay for the answer, we will send you the recording. So um, I'm gonna start with a question that seems to be on a few people's mind and it is about cold weather because, uh, and I don't wanna stereotype us, I do believe them, a lot of them are coming from colder parts of Canada. And they, they, Dale on Facebook said he's seen designs for northern growers that include a frost sink, a trench that runs the length of the structure along the bottom of the glazing that drops below ground level about three to four feet. Um, and do you recommend a frost trench for northern gardeners? And that plays in. I would, I would certainly look into it. Yeah, I would certainly look into it. And the northern gardeners, you want to be super careful about your insulation. Um, I would look at 
R60 in your walls in ceiling. I mean, R60, R70. And I'd be super careful about um, the glazing. I'd use a, uh, you know, a, 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 a three wall uh, polycarbonate. I'd put a good insulation blanket on there as well. But I definitely would look at putting in some kind of a cold sink like that. Okay. And, and, so and, and I would also, if you're in a cold sunny location, it's so much easier than a cold cloudy location. So, um, you know, there, there, in the book, there's a, there's a, some data from a Chinese greenhouse that was built in, uh, uh, I think, Alberta, Canada. And it showed that the greenhouse was like 57 degrees warmer than the ambient temperature. Now, it was only one day's worth of data, but um, these greenhouses have a really, uh, are, can be really promising, especially, I mean, if it's cold and sunny, um, that's even better. If it's cold and cloudy, it's going to be a lot more challenging. Okay, so that plays into some people's questions about um, when they have re reduced daylight hours in the winter and then the temps drop below 40, um, but then their temps in the days are 20 to 30 uh, in the summer, then that, that works out. But if you're having colder summers as well, would this still be an applicable choice for them? If you're having colder summers as well? This, that... this person's having a warmer summer. So Diane says in the summer that they get long daylight hours and temps to mid 20s. 30s, and that would be Celsius. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting is the Chinese actually move their growing operations outdoors in the summer. And that's partly because they've built these long structures with almost flat roofs. So they get so much solar gain in the summer that it's almost impossible to grow in them. Right. Um, I think if, if it's, if, it, if you're in a sunny uh, climate, I mean, if it's, if this is someone in Canada, I assume, I believe so. Uh, okay. 600 miles from the Arctic Circle. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it should work fine up there as long as you've got the sunshine. Okay, great. That's the key. And, and then um, James on Zoom, he's asking if this is practical for smaller greenhouses, say 10 by 10, or are you going to have to think bigger with the Chinese? You know, it's, it's hard to, you could build a little tiny, um, and I wouldn't do 10 by 10, I'd make it rectangular. I'd, I'd maybe make it five by 20, make it, make it shallower and longer, but um, you could do it. I mean, that's, we, that's how we started. We were just going to start with a little dinky one. We got it all excavated and then and I thought, nah, that's not going to be enough. <laughs> so, so ours is, uh, is basically 30 feet long and about 25 feet wide. Um, it, this could be, if you've got a 20 foot space and you could go, eight feet deep, that would be good. Okay. You could, you could build a small one. Um, it's going to be harder to earth shelter it and whatnot, but you could do it. Okay. And um, Cindy's asking, how do you control mold growth with the, with, when you're combining the aquaponics and the humidity? Cindy, that's a huge issue. What we've done is, as I mentioned earlier, we took all those solar, solar modules. These were solar modules that were on my house in the 90s in Colorado. And when I started renting that property, I upgraded the solar system and I kept all the modules. We mounted them on a rack in front of the greenhouse. And what they do is when the sun comes up, they immediately start producing electricity. And we have mounted a number of those um, DC fans that you like the fans you see on the, I don't know how many people have been in a truck, but you see these DC fans on the dashboard of a truck kind of try to keep the cool driver cooler, yeah. these little metal DC fans. And we've mounted them um, up uh, so that they're um, strategically located throughout the greenhouse. And that creates a lot of air movement, a lot of air movement. And, and we've also, I wish I could show you this. We've also installed some uh, even higher power um, DC fans up near the ceiling. The whole secret is to keep air moving in that greenhouse. And that, the, the one thing when I first, started growing here, I just packed it solid. <laughs> it was, you know, I thought, oh my God, I got all this space. There wasn't a square centimeter of space that you couldn't grow in. You know, I was just jam full and that did not work. That led me <laughs> a lot of problems with that, um, that mold they call, what do they call it? Soot. And um, that's been a big one here. But this year I, I, I got 
I found my sanity and I started spacing things much farther apart. We mounted, mounted all those fans. Right now we've got, let's see how many we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we're, we're mounting at least three more this summer. So we've got nine DC fans that run no batteries directly off the solar modules and they just keep that air moving. Okay. So it's really important. And in the aquaponic systems, I'm growing in rafts too. And the rafts, the rafts, if, if you're an aquaponic grower, the rafts help reduce the amount of evaporation from the surface. And in addition, one of the fish tanks, God, I wish, come, Cindy, come, I'll show you, but we, we built a kind of a lid on one of the fish tanks that reduces evaporation. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, probably 70 or 80% of the heat loss from a fish tank or from a water tank is going to be evaporation from the surface. So okay. we, we built a cover over it to, to reduce that. That not only helps the tank stay warmer, but also reduces the amount of ev evaporation. So this may play in a little bit in terms, uh, Cindy was asking if you have any ideas on non-electric ways to cool the greenhouse in, um, because their solar powered fan isn't enough. Yeah, we, in, in the very last page of the book, um, <laughs> we just completed this before the book went to publication. So <laughs> my editors at New Society, you guys are really good to me. Let me slip it in at the very, very end. <laughs> we built two wind scoops. <laughs> We, we are, we're up on a hill. We get some, a fairly good amount of wind, even in the, in the summer, good breezes. So we built out a six inch PVC pipe, these wind scoops. And what they do is they, let's see if I can illustrate this. They poke through the wall of the greenhouse, go up about eight or nine feet, and then, and then, and then uh, head into the wind. So in the summer, in the summer, we open those up and we get this cool breeze that circulates through the greenhouse just from those two six inch wind scoops. So that's something to think about as well. That's really cool. Yeah. Now, in, in we, so in the summer, we pull that uh, shade cloth down and that keeps it cooler. I usually, what I really try to do is I try to leave the sunshade off for the first two or three hours of bright sunshine. And then, you know, maybe 11 or 12 o'clock, then I bring it down and we'll get less sunlight, but it'll stay cooler. I, I open the front windows. The, the three of the windows on the south side are operable. I have a screen door, which I can leave open. And then I have this wind scoop. We also did mount an AC vent fan as well, because we just, you know, cooling a greenhouse in summer is really challenging. You know, um, you get a thousand watts of heat wow. per square meter coming in. That's like that's that's a that's a lot of heat coming in per, so square, per square foot per square foot and you're uh, really happy you're not sitting there doing this talk in the summer right yeah oh yeah well i had yeah exactly <laughs> um and then something on people's mind of course is always watering and so what kind of watering system you're using and do you use a catchment at all you know we don't we're going to put up a catchment system our um our well water is quite basic. It's like eight, pH 8.4. And so um, in the aquaponics system, we like to bring that pH down to about seven. So I'm constantly adjusting that. So we, we have it set up. So we're going to put rain catchment so we can get a, a, a rain that's below pH seven or probably closer to pH six or so. Um, so definitely I would do that. We don't have an automatic system. It's all by hand. And what I do basically is I just use the water from the aquaponics system to water all the plants that are growing in soil. So we oh. just, I just scoop oh, that yeah. out in a water bucket and do it by hand. But we, we are thinking we, we'd love to do some canoeing this summer. So we're thinking about putting in an automatic watering system as well. Nice. So I think we have time for one more question and then we'll do our book giveaway and subscription giveaway. And so this is a big question, I think, for people. And this comes from Scott and he's asking, are Chinese greenhouse systems cost effective to build? Well, you know, they can be. Um, that's a tough question. I, I visited a Chinese greenhouse. I'm not going to say where, but I visited one because <laughs> I don't want to get anybody in trouble or embarrassed, but they spent $80,000 on the plastic. They used this um, really state-of-the-art plastic covering. It's called ETFE extremely expensive and my question was how many heads of lettuce do you have to grow just to pay that <laughs> you, know? you got you got to grow a ton 
So, um, you know, I would say be real careful when you do it. That's why, that's why we built with rammed earth tires. We used soil. We were very fortunate. We had a bunch of lumber left over from building our house. And um, so we used a lot of materials. We kept the cost way, way down. Um, I believe it could be economically effective. You'd have to kind of run the math on it. If, if you think it's going to cost you 20 grand, um, is it worth it? Is it worth being able to grow year round for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years? Probably. You know, if you're going to grow commercially, and we do, we primarily, this greenhouse is here primarily for us, but all the surplus gets sold at farmer's markets. We, we belong to a CSA, we provide to a CSA, and we also provide, we sell it at farmer's market. So um, are we getting rich? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> it's coming. <common. laughs> I'll have my solar powered jet before you know it. <laughs> I have to come see us when you, that happens. <laughs> All right, yeah. When I get my solar power jet, I'll be there. <laughs> well, thank Made you so of... much, Dan. My pleasure, um, really. Yeah, thank it's you, awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, for uh, New Society, we're based on the West Coast of Canada, and we have authors sort of all over the world, and we don't often get to see one another in person, oh, and we yeah. certainly haven't been able to this year, and it's always a joy when we get to go to a fair or a conference and see you in person, and uh, so this is, I guess, the next best thing, so we appreciate your time and all of your knowledge and sharing that with us, and for all everybody um, who registered for the event, you will receive a, a recording of the webinar, and we will also post it to our YouTube channel, so if you weren't able to stay for because of other commitments, um, you will still be able to, to watch the video. So we'd like to announce that James Moncrief is the winner of the Chinese Greenhouse um, giveaway, and we'll be in touch to get your contact the book. information. Not the Chinese the Greenhouse. Not the, the Greenhouse, no. Greenhouse. <laughs> Sarah. Not the Greenhouse itself, the book. So you can build your own. Um, and Rosemary Cairns is the winner of our subscription for Harrow Smith. So we'll be in touch to Hold get Hold a second, I gotta grab something real quickly. Oh, oh, and here is the Chinese Greenhouse, and it is available on our website. Um, for those of you who didn't win, um, use the code CHIRAS25 and you get a 25% discount on this book and any other of Dan's books with us. Um, again, remember to sign up for our newsletter so you can learn about events, um, sales, at book, experts, book excerpts and uh, giveaways that we have happening. Um, and I want to thank Brittany, who was in the background, uh, helping everybody out. I know we still had a couple issues with our links, so thank you to everybody for your patience. Um, and um, thank you to Brittany for coordinating everything behind the scenes. It's much appreciated. Um, and I don't know if I'm missing anything. Um, thanking Dan, of course, we appreciate it. And our next event, April 22nd, with Bevan Cohen and learning all about making your own salves and oils and all those fun things with his book, The Artisan Herbalist. So thank you, Dan. Well, you, my pleasure, guys. This is, this is the finest publisher in the world. I, <laughs> I don't know how many books I have with you guys, 14 or something, 15. I, I lost track, 16. But <clears throat> these guys practice what they preach. I mean, they, they produce books with recyc on recycled paper. They're carbon neutral. And they're there to change the world. It's one of the finest publishers around. And buy books directly from them or through Barnes and Noble, um, where you where publishers yeah. and the authors get a better share of the that's, that's right. that would be my recommendation. Sorry. Yes, thank Free you. Commercial well, that's 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 now too. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully the next time we do this, we'll, we'll it'll be in person. So yeah. So maybe we'll <laughs> see you. Maybe we'll see you in Pennsylvania in September or Texas in October at the Mother Earth News Fair. Yeah, so thanks everybody. And thanks for spending, taking the time out of your day, everybody to spend it with us.